National Ocean Sciences Bowl Professional Development Webinar Series. This is something that we provide mostly for the coaches who are preparing their students for the competitions, but um, we have all educators who are interested in using these lessons that they learn in the webinar series into their classrooms. We love to have all of them participate. Um, as a reminder, we do record these webinars, so if you aren't able to participate and watch them live, or you think you have a, a friend, a student, or another educator who you think are interested, we do ask you to please share the links to the recorded webinars. Um, just for a basic schedule for our webinar, tonight we're going to have about another hour presentation by um, Drs. Aguilar and Cool. And then we'll have a 30-minute question and answer session. So anyone who's participating this evening, down in the lower right-hand corner, you should see a Q&A box. At any point during their presentation tonight, if you have a question or a comment, just go right ahead and type your question into that box. I will be monitoring that box all evening. And when they are finished with their presentation, um, we'll go into the question answer session and I'll read the questions aloud to our speakers that so they can answer them for you. Also, if you have any comments or feedback that you'd like to provide either on the webinar series or speakers this evening, please also type that into the Q&A box. That's the, the main mode of um, communication between the participants and the national office this evening. Um, I'd like to thank you for participating this evening and hope that you will all really use the Q&A box tonight and ask some questions. We have two experts this evening who they're going to be presenting their second webinar on this topic of the Lake Michigan food web and invasive species. And tonight in particular, they're going to be presenting a paper of theirs where they're basically putting this food web that they're discussing into practice. So this is your opportunity to really ask questions about food webs and what they're um, presenting tonight and the paper itself that um, they asked for everyone to read in preparation for this webinar. So I, I ask that you take full advantage of this evening. So with that, I'm going to turn the webinar over to our speakers this evening, um, both Dr. Pilar and Dr. Kuhl, um, as you might already know, are with the Great Lakes Water Institute at the School of Freshwater Sciences at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and we're excited that their, their university is going to be the host for finals this year. So the students who end up at finals will probably meet these two wonderful scientists in April. So I'm going to stop speaking and let our speakers uh, begin their webinar and presentation this evening. Hi, how are you? Good night, and it's great that you are listening to this um, changing in aquatic food web from the inside out. We're really excited to join um, join you again, and thank you for so for being here. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm Dr. Cool, and I'm a marine biologist, and I really am. I have a uh, 2,000 days at sea, and I've been over all the world's oceans except for the Arctic. I've been working in the Great Lakes and particularly in Lake Michigan for uh, over 15 years now. And so I have a pretty decent ability to compare and contrast marine and freshwater environments. And I'm Carmen Aguilar, and uh, I am very interested in food web interactions in uh, freshwater and also the marine environment. And uh, this is a really great opportunity to share with you some of our data and also some of the things that, uh, activities that we have uh, done with teachers and some of the data would be um, presented here. So all Great Lakes are not the same. We're picking up from our last webinar. If you didn't see it, uh, you'll be able to follow along with this one just fine. But if you did see it, then you'll draw the relationship between our development of a fundamental food web uh, and the differences among the Great Lakes and how the food web operates in Lake Michigan at a fundamental scale. Today, we're going to perturb that food web. 
So what we're going to show you on the next slides, we're going to go a little bit fast, but uh, what we're going to do is we're going to give these slides to um, to be put up in the web, in the uh, yeah in the website, and so you can download them and then you can play as it may um, play with the different uh, things that we're showing you tonight. So here we go. We're going to delve into our really exciting um, food web. So this is a simulation of a Lake Michigan food web using pictures of organisms that live in Lake Michigan. And then some of these pictures were taken by us and some are taken by others. Many of the credits are too small to read. Up here are the phytoplankton. They are the algae, the photosynthetic primary producers. And here are the tiny, tiny algae, the picoplankton. Here we have the zooplankton, which are the primary herbivores and the primary carnivores on each other. And then here we have the microzooplankton, which are tiny animals that can eat tiny algae. And here we have predatory animals like uh, bithotrifes, and we have predatory animals like the, the mycid, the possum shrimp. Here we have our uh, forage fish, the small planktivorous fish, the middle carnivorous fish, and then we have the mega top predator fish. Down at the bottom we have quagga mussels, we have amphipods that live in the mud, and we have worms. And what you see are arrows that move from one animal to another. So here's a mycid, and we see an arrow that goes to this lake trout. And that means that it is eaten by the lake trout. OK, here we have a zooplankton, and we see an arrow that goes to this different one. And that means that that different one eats that. So each arrow points at the thing that eats it. And now we're going to set up a little way of looking at how food webs change. And I want to, whoops, I want to draw your attention to this. Each arrow costs about 80 to 90 percent in energy. So every time you add an arrow, it costs you 80 to 90 percent. Okay, so this is our day job, but for some people it's a game. It's a quick construction of a simple food web as occurs in Lake Michigan. Uh, what we just looked at are organisms of the food web, and it's just to get an idea. Then you think about some change that might happen, and you follow its consequences among the inhabitants. There are clusters of organisms that I pointed out, each representing a trophic level producers, microzooplankton consumers, top predators, and so on. And they're connected by the arrows running from the food to the consumer. To play, choose an intensive organism from table one. You all have seen the paper in theory, and we discussed table one, which was the invasives in Lake Michigan um, last time. And basically, you take an organism that is a new invasive, to Lake Michigan, you put it in the food web, and then you increase the consumers that eat it, and you decrease the prey that it eats, and you ask, how does this change the food web? Remember that not every invader wipes out everything that was there before. Sometimes they just compete with a numerically proportional effect. So if there's 10% of the new invader, of 10% of the function. This is really well exemplified by the spiny and fish hook water fleas and many of the salmon. You know that many salmon and trout live together in the same lake. And they're competing, but they are not making each other extinct. On the other hand, they may have a distinct effect, like alewife, or they may be devastating. By studying of the invaders pretty well, you can put a reasonable outcome on their impact. So we're going to do two examples. In our paper, we discussed 
discussed four major, uh, what we'll call game-changing invaders. The first of them was the sea lamprey. What is eat? And eat is in quotation marks for the lamprey because it doesn't really actually eat the fish. It just grabs onto them and sucks the life juices out of them. It uses lake trout, whitefish, and other large fish as its host. And what eats it? Nothing. There's hardly anything that we know of that actually eats sea lampreys, so they have no predators. How much impact did it have? It was giant. Lamprey wiped out lake trout. That's pretty giant. It didn't change structure of Lake Michigan, but it sure changed the structure of the Lake Michigan food web. And, and so then we can think of things that happened as a result of the lake trout going away. There's a relief of predation on forage. There's the opening of a niche or an opportunity for other planktivorous fish or small fish. And because they, uh, those fish eat the zooplankton, we, we lose a lot of the zooplankton. So here we have the sea lamp. And as we've been telling you, it's just a major parasite on larger fish. It just got into the well and canal in the, canal in the 1920s. I uh, got into Lake Michigan in the 1930s and had a large impact on the lake trout and the salmon and huge investment was made to control it. And this is controlled chemically, so then it doesn't go into the lake and they do that um, in the rivers. So this is an idea of um, how it uh, really attacks the fish. And then you'll see that they wear it in a fashionable way. But you know, fishermen and nobody really wants to be seeing this. And this is the way that attached to the fish and they make a hole in them and that's how they suck the um their blood and all the juices out of the animals what so here is um a decline in the lake trout and you can see how in lake michigan it really had a huge effect and um, also in lake huron and those are lakes that have been used to be um, to pair them in to um, discuss the consequences of that. And as you can see, then Lake Ontario and Lake Superior had less of that. But you can see how once they really got going, the trout was completely decimated. So that was a huge effect of that organism. Here's our food web again. And added the sea lamprey, which is not shown, but its major impact was to X out big predatory fish, the piscivore, the ones that eat other fish. Well, because of that, all these things in green that the, that the lake trout and the other big fish ate, they weren't eaten anymore by them, and so these guys could grow. Perch could grow, whitefish and chub and uh, other fish could, small fish could grow, mycids did better. Because of that, the things that they ate, like the zooplankton, decreased. And so this is how we think about this, as we look at the first impact is to increase the activity of the small fish that they used to eat, and then that decreases the activity of what those fish ate. So we have the alewife. And that's a really nice fish. It's from the herring family, and um, it usually is from the marine environment. And so the first record was in the 1940s, and it was very common in the 50s. And like Russell mentioned before, it eats a plankton. And there, um, the explosive growth, as you can see here, you know, really um, kind of decimated all the food that they had to eat, and there was not enough. And here you would see them along the beach in um, Lake Michigan. And it was um, a really huge problem. And the huge die off um, was in the 1960s that, you know, people still talk about. And if you look in the references out in the 
neighbors around the Lake Michigan um, beaches in uh, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin. It was huge all over the place. So then what did they decide? They decided that they we're going to introduce salmon to then control the alewife population. And you know, Carmen, and one of the things that's really interesting is that both the lamprey and the alewife swam up the rivers and through the lakes by themselves. Nobody brought them in. They just migrated as soon as the barrier at Niagara was removed. So here we're adding alewife. Why? Because the lake trout is gone. And what does alewife eat? They eat plankton and they eat bottom invertebrates. And who eats alewife? Some middle carnivorous fish like perch virtually all the piscivores, the big predatory fish, and birds like seals and cormorants eat uh, alewife also. How much impact did it have? It was mega also. It grew to obnoxious population levels and then would die off in the spring leading to uh, significant problems on the beach. And the downstream effects mean that there are greater there was greater competition among forage fish, and it opened a new niche for a new top predator. So here's our diagram with the alewife, and what it shows is that when they were enhanced, that the zooplankton and the phytoplankton were decreased, and in the green dotted circle, there's an opportunity for a new top predator. So here we have the overpopulation that we have been showing you, and then they, they're uh, schooling here. And again, this is in another uh, part of the lake. So here you can see how they were really um, dense in population in the 70s, and you can see how then they are decreasing um, with time here. And then they are just now uh, background population. And we still see them when we go out on the lake. So what caused their population to Decline, Carmen. The lack of food. No, the population oh. of the alewives. Of the alewives. Didn't well, we there do were no, something? There were no predators anymore. Right, so we because, had to add a <laughs> Because they were decimated by the seal lamprey, and then, you know, this happened. And then this this is the, the uh, result of that. Big changes in that. So now... So what we did was humans decided to manage the alewife problem by adding a new invader that was added to themselves, top predators, salmon and trout. This would not only reduce the overabundant alewife population, but it also would provide a new sport fishery. So in the mid-1960s, the fish uh, uh, control people added uh, coho and chinook and a variety of salmon and trout and that balanced against the decline of lake trout and it consumed the alewife population. If you can believe it, that in itself is another seminar. So you guys go ahead at home and continue with other examples. You and your students can uh, add predators or add uh, new invaders and then find out what happens. Remember that before lamprey forage fish were around, not everything is always wiped out. So predatory water fleas, for example, which you'll see in the table, uh, competed with established natives like Leptodora, which, which is a predatory clipstrin, that eats other small animals. And none of them had overwhelming dominance. They lived in different zones. They lived, they coexisted. So pond whys and wherefores of the various competition outcomes. And go check out the invader competition game, Eco Defenders on the Jason approved website. Okay, so now we're going to move on into some of the things that we discussed last time. And we talk a, a little bit about the zebra mussel. And here um, I have the picture of a clam that has been closed by all those zebra mussels. So then this cannot feed. So we know that it was transported in the ballast water, such as a lot of the other organisms that we're going to be talking about. And they are um, required, they require the uh, um, warm water. So we find them in the shallow waters in Lake Michigan and the coastal areas. They had major economic impacts. 
And like we were talking um, last time, they have many effects. And we're going to just touch on some of those and why did they get wiped out by their so this is the, the, the stage. And again, remember that they really like hard surfaces, like, like pipes and all this kind of uh, material. So the zebra mussel really had another impact in um, the removing of that food that the yellow perch really eat. And you see here, the, that was just an, another thing that provided um, a problem that provided a problem that gave a problem to the perch because then they lacked food and they were um, being taken away in big numbers. Uh, so then now we don't have a commercial fishery of the perch, and that was one of the most important things. We saw this graph at the end of the uh, program last time, and what I just want to remind you is like more quaggas are in this above line and then more zebras would be here. The other thing that I wanted to see is how I put them here. The zebras, they had a flat surface, so they would be resting like this on the bottom, and the quaggas would be upright, and so the siphon would be sticking out here, and the siphon here would be sticking out such. So that's going to become an important component here. So you can see that we started seeing them in 2003, and by the end of 2005, look, there's really no zebra mussels to be found. And so if we were to, to find, uh, look for zebra mussels right now, we say that they're so last century, we just did not find them in Lake Michigan. So there's just maybe in the marinas and such, but there's no more of those. So now we're going to be talking about the tail of two mussels. We were talking um, that the zebra mussels really like they were hogging the coastal area. They like the the really warm water and hard surfaces. So here we find rocks, and um, these are the stations that we usually sample. So these are north of the harbor, south of the harbor, and then we visit several uh, stations along this side. This is our time series station, Fox Point, that is a 100 meter station. And then here we have the uh, Mid Lake Reef complex. Now, for us to come to, from here to Fox Point is like an hour and a half, and that's 12 nautical miles. And here to get to over here is 15 nautical miles. And this, this is the line that is uh, Wisconsin over here, Michigan over there. So we, we look at that, and you can see very different types of environment here. We were just out at Fox Point on Monday for one of our midwinter samples. That was very exciting. Okay, so recruitment. The quagga mussels and the zebra mussels both re reproduce by broadcast spawning. That means that they spew the sperm and eggs into the water and they meet. And then the little babies swim in the plankton for uh, a month to six weeks, and then they settle on hard surfaces and they grow out. And so this picture shows the idea of cohorts. The blue ones were adults, and the red ones were their offspring. So in between is one year. They, they spawn annually. So if we look at our two samples, we see that between the red and blue, there's virtually no animals, and that's because it's very early. And they have grown from 3 to 13, which is about 10 millimeters, or from 5 to 19, which is about 14 millimeters in length over one year. That is assuming, as we know, that once a year they spawn that. Also, they get a little bit bigger as we move through the winter between October and July. But really what we're looking at is the 10 to 15 millimeters per year that they grew. And you can see in the picture a nice little batch of little baby ones on a small adult. And then the other thing that I wanted to, to think about while we're doing this is that all these, uh, the offspring, when they are villagers or they, when they're really tiny after they had just spawned, they become part of the 
plankton components. So they would also be floating around, but they would be eating some of that uh, phytoplankton as well in part of that. So now here what we have in the East Reef, and these are like the quaggas, but you can see how we have a lot of recruitment in the fall. And many of these small samples that a lot of our students were measuring, like the two millimeters, so that took a long time. And the bigger one, the one that we had was 24 millimeters here. So we have like a, a really nice population, and those are in the middle of the lake. So now, who ecologically wins? We have the new invader, the quagga that was uh, coming in. Um, and then it was trying to take over the established zebra mussel. Now, how, how did this work for the zebra mussel? As we told you, we have been, um, they have been wiped out, but let's see why that was. Why did they get wiped out? So in the shallow waters, quagga mussels are, in the deep water, quagga mussels were white. And then in the shallow water where there's sunlight, they take on some of the coloration similar to zebra mussels. But they're both about the same size. They both eat about the same food. And so one might say, well, how come the quagga mussels were able to outcompete the zebra mussels so quickly? So we're going to do a little bit of hypothesis testing here. And we're going to actually use measurements to answer some of these fundamental questions and then we'll review the reasons why the quagga mussels did so well. So our first hypothesis is quagga mussels are capable of active growth in coastal western Lake Michigan waters. It is, do they actually grow here? The method is to go sample the same site over and over on an appropriate time frame and then measure the size distribution of the quagga mussels. This only works early in the game because as the mussels uh, become more older, um, the, the growth rate smears and the size frequency distribution begins to look bad. Okay. Here in, uh, at the Linwood 20 meter station, which is a, a warm area that the zebra mussels could live, we're looking at quagga mussels from 2003, which are about 3.6 millimeters. June of 2004, and they're about 11. So they've grown seven and a little bit on average. Uh, so they were able to grow there. Grow there. So our first hypothesis is that quagga mussels can effectively compete with zebra mussels in coastal Lake Michigan habitats. Here our method is to sample, count, and measure the distribution of both species at various locations over time. How, do, you, do you think they'd be interested in seeing how we sample those? I think that would be great. And then uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, we had a lot of teachers and uh, undergraduates and high school kids um, helping us with this. If you see how many we measure, you know, if you add them all up, it just becomes a huge amount of muscles that we had to count and measure in able for, for us to be able to show you this data. So here's in Linwood at 20 meter station. And then we have the submarine um, slurp of the quagga mussels. And they dominate by the numbers. But then the zebra mussels are larger. You know, you see this part. So the largest one is 23. And on average, they are also, um, you know, here. So this population would be our quagga mussel, and the red in this case would be our zebra mussel. So you can see how they're a little bit, these guys more in number, but then these guys get bigger. So that's going to be an important component when we are putting together this story here. So how do we do this? This is our uh, student that now uh, is uh, graduate student at Georgia Tech. And what we used to do is like we sample, we grab the sample and everybody has seen the calipers. So you go each one, you measure uh, like she has here. So you go into here, you measure them. And then we also look at the weight. And then of, of course, you know, this is columns and columns. Each column is 30, 30 muscles. So you can start getting the idea of how many of these 
uh, people have to measure, including ourselves. And then you smell like muscle. So now the other the other um, hypothesis that is regarding of the way that we sample. So in this case, we're going to talk about the polar graphs that have a high proportion of quivers because, as we're going to show you, they can be very inefficient uh, as collecting the rocky bottom. And now the zebra muscles would attach to the hard surfaces. So if we were to see our zebra and quagga muscle here, and of course you're not going to be able to see it, but if we were to have our zebras, they really attach really hard. I'm going to go with Right, we use uh, steel wool for the zebra muscle bristle thread. So this has uh, the steel wool, and you can see when you pull, it's very hard to get them off. Now here we have a quagga that has like a cotton thing, and so when you take them off, you know, it's much easier to take them off that surface. So you can see how the attachment really becomes a very important component of how they are going to be um, present in those, um, in those kind of substrates. So the ponar grab really is very effective only on the flat bottoms where there's sand or clay or mud. And the uh, zebra mussels are more happy on hard stuff like rocks. So it's not a big surprise that the ponar grab samples are dominated by quagga mussels early in the game. The bar across the middle at 0.5 is where there's an e equal number of zebra mussels and quagga mussels in a sample. And you can see that every single ponar sample that we took during this period uh, was dominated by quagga mussels. Now, our next hypothesis is the one that really gets us to show you how we sample. And that is that if we use a remotely operated vehicle so that we can sample well from rocks, that's going to have a much greater proportion of zebra mussels because that's where they like to be. And so the way that we test is we use the ponar and we use the remotely operated vehicle on the same day at the same station and then we compare the distribution of samples. So let's see how that works, Carmen. And that's an important component because when you're going out on a cruise you have to decide, well, what am I going to use to sample a certain substrate? And then you start seeing how the different things that you want to use may give you um, what you're looking for or may have some challenges in itself. That's right. You don't just reach into your pocket to get out a remotely <laughs> operated vehicle. So here, for example, is that. So here we have a pilot, and this is a tethered ROV. So you get to see what you're sampling. And uh, as we were saying, um, the zebra mussels attach really strongly to the surfaces. So you can see there that we can wipe a certain uh, area, and then we can count and do the quantitative um, evaluation of how much it wiped. And you know, I don't see here the two red dots, but usually there were two dots that you could see what your area was. Now here in the same station, the ponar grab, look at how it hits the rock and falls over. Oh, he's no fun. Now that's not going to get a very good sample. But you don't know that because you don't always have an ROV down there to watch the ponar. And so sometimes you come up with an empty one and, and you go, oh, there must be nothing there. But the reality is that you just hit a rock and fell over. And you can see, see how your environment is very patchy. So if you land here and if you land here, then you don't know. And so some of that. Um, that is also an important consideration when you are uh, analyzing your data. So this is basically a jaw that goes down and grabs a sample. And so here we compare those. And on the left is the submarine slurping the top of a rock. And on the right is a ponar grab from the same station. And what you can see is that all the ponar grabs have more quagga mussels above the black line. And all the ROV samples the rocks have fewer quagga mussels as a proportion at this time. This was early in the invasion. So our next hypothesis was that quagga mussels will dominate uh, in deeper samples. That is, the, the um, deepest samples where the water never gets warm 
will be a hundred percent quagga mussels and zebra mussels will never live there. And how we test that is we go from inshore where it's warm to offshore where it's cold and we sample all along that gradient. Okay, so when we collect from this gradient, that's going to be a really important thing. And now we have been telling you that we have been seeing more and they're, they're marching around. So we're going to look at some of the issues of what we are talking about. So here, um, as we mentioned before, this is the area where the, quagga, the zebra mussels were, sorry, uh, hogging the coast and shallow waters where the rocks are. And that's going to be one component of their, you know, why they were, uh, the quagga mussels were successful. Now, the quagga mussels have been found deeper than 80 meters, and they, this area here where we find the quagga mussels, and now we find quagga mussels here, quagga mussels there, but this area was never inhabited by zebra mussels. And this is cold water. This is even during the summer. It's 4 degrees centigrade down there, so this never gets warm down in the bottom. So the zebra mussels were just kind of... Um, anchored here, and the quagga mussels could also be here, and we're going to talk about what happened there, but they could be marching all the way to the different areas in uh, Lake Michigan, in the deeper areas. So now, how do we know that? Well, if we were to plot here the depth of the collection of the, of the mussels that we have and the proportion of the quagga mussels, we observe right away that um, after you know, if we were to go deeper than 30 meters, look at that. We don't have more zebras here, right? So what do we observe? That this is the domain of those quaggas. So we're going 30 meters, 40 meters, 50 meters, 60 meters, 70, and now we have them at 80, 90, 120 meters where we have sampled. Not very many, but they're there. But even in the shallow station, they ultimately took over. Right. So this is the part where uh, this is early, and then so we could see them both there. So eventually they outcompeted their cousin, and they came from the same place. Now, what are some of the um, issues with this, or what are the some of the things that we have observed? And then we're going back to the paper again and showing you some of the the graphs here. But if you go there, there's videos there. So what we have here in this picture this page of pictures is, this is a transect of bottom videos from uh, shallow to deep water. So here's 10 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters, 40 meters, 50 meters along the coast, then way out in the middle of the lake at 40 meters on Sheboygan Reef, and then a couple of nice uh, steps and, and bluffs on the 60 meters deep uh, at the Northeast Reef. And these are getting up to very high population densities. Carmen is going to show you an early sample at 10,000 per square meter. And so if you were to take a Ponar sample and then look at and count all these, you can tell me. This, yeah, is that's that good? perfect right there. So this is showing you 10,000 per square meter. To, and then in this one, of course, we, we don't have little tiny ones. So if we were to add some of those, it would go really in high densities fast. The other thing that I, can they see that? No. Up. Okay. Down? Up. up. Yeah. Okay. So okay. here, there. what I'm trying to Perfect. show you, oh, okay. What I'm trying to show you here is how they sit on the sand. You can see how they are upright and the sand is kind of on, kind of, um, kind of buried in there. So one of the other things is that if they find something like that, they have really long bristle threads like that. And we're going to show you a little bit uh, later how that uh, really becomes an important component for them. Move on. Yeah, their attachment is really important. So uh, this is all throughout uh, south, southwestern Lake Michigan. And then here are, is, is a comparison of 20 meter station during the zebra mussel period versus during the quagga mussel period. And you can see how the clay was colonized. Also, there's a sample down here that was taken in 2001 before mussels, and then 2004, after only one year of mussels, we out on the Mid Lake Reef 
and you can see where there was nothing versus where there's something. So now, one of the things that is really important here, sorry, that is very important here is that you're looking at where they are in the shallower areas, where they are in the deeper areas, and we have talked about that the sea mussels really prefer to be in the warmer zones, and the quaggas are in the open. Now, when we look, we're going to look now here, and I want you to really think about the um, movie that we're going to see next. What is important about it is that this is all with natural light. And we're talking about 60 meters in 2007. So here we're moving along the bottom out at the northeast reef at 58 meters, 57 meters. This is formerly this would have been bare field stone. It's it's actually limestone, former coral reefs, island of former coral reefs. And what you can see is that there's no square centimeter that's empty. The entire place is completely covered with quagga mussels. And then the kind of um, out of
whitish but nothing like we used to see before so they're here but they're not they're not abundant so now this layer here represents the ones that would be your very small all organisms hard to eat that to digest and such and uh, they would be like your sunflower seeds in the shell you have to work hard to get that little uh, um, bit more of energy and then some of the organisms won't have the lipids that this provides so zooplankton need that for uh, reproducing and for the eggs as well as the such. So now, one of the big differences that we see from before is that we have this shift from up here, having our phytoplankton, and then look at that. Now we don't have our just our daporia. We started adding and adding and adding mussels, and this is what we are calling that benthification. A lot of the energy is being shifted from the top to the bottom. And that's going to become a big um, uh, one of the discussions that we're going to have in a little bit. That is going to be an important component or what happened to all these fish with this increase here. And the other thing that I want you to think about is that that middle of the lake really didn't have any sediment at all. So, so that was all pure rock because nothing really stayed there. There was no mechanism to sedimentation there. Well, guess what? Now, with the inset of all these quagga mussels, well, now a lot of the circulation is being, um, you know, changed, and some of those particles that the, these guys are trapping and putting in the bottom are accumulating in this area. So let me just show you what are the effects on the phytoplankton. So we show it graphically, graphically, and then here what I want you to see is that the prequagga mussels are these top panels. The left one here is the prequagga, and this is our surface waters at the Fox Point, the 100 meter station. And this is, we're calling it the deep chlorophyll maximum. And usually that fluctuates 25, 30 meters. So what are we what are we showing you here? The important component here is that these brown uh, dots would be representing those uh, diatoms that we showed you. These are bigger than 10 micron uh, cells, and the red would be those little dots that would be um, the cyanobacteria, and those would be these red dots. Here we're going from like uh, July. What is that, July? January. January. Oh, from the whole year. Uh, imagine that. I did the whole year. Uh, from January all the way to December. And so here would be our summer part. So what do we see? So we see that before the quagga mussels, we have a large percentage of the bigger than 10. Uh, micrometers in the surface waters as well and is as in the deep chlorophyll maximum. Now, let me bring your attention to the to the bottom panel here, and the same thing we have the surface and the DCM here. Look at how it has shifted dramatically. It's a dramatic component. It's a dramatic change in the components of the food web that we have for the phytoplankton. So now look at this. Now we flip flop and we have now a lot of that picocyanobacteria here, our diatoms down here, and the same thing happens in that deep chlorophyll maximum. So this is a huge change that we are observing. So we're going to now put all this stuff together into a simple conceptual model that involves geology, physics, biology, and chemistry. And we're particularly focusing on the Mid Lake Reef complex here because this is uh, a big factor in the ecology of these mussels. And in Lake Michigan, there is a persistent current that moves from the north to the south. And when it intercepts these underwater mountains, it rises up. If you've ever been on a picnic on a hill, you know that it's really windy on top of the hill compared to in the valley. 
And when there's water blowing along here in a current, it's the same thing. It hits these hills, it goes up to the top, and it's really windy on top. So now, here is our model of how the quagga mussels completely altered the, the, the biogeochemistry, the food web, and the physical structure of Lake Michigan. Here's our hill. It's very steep at the front, and then there's a plateau. This is the northeast reef right here. Deep in the front, and then a plateau. Here comes the current, and here's our diatom, deep chlorophyll maximum of diatoms, and here the green is all our nice, yummy, juicy steaks of the food web. And then here comes the current, and the current comes up, and when it gets up above, this is from the north. So here comes from the north. Again, we can look here. Coming from the north, down towards the south, hitting the mountain, going up, and then because the earth is spinning around, when it goes up the mountain, the water starts to circulate in a spiral. It's called a Taylor column, after the name of the physical oceanographer that described it. And it's like your toilet. And when it does that, then it sucks the algae that are in the upper water here down to what? To the mussels, because the whole top of the reef is covered with those mussels, each of them sucking a liter of particles a day. And, and so here goes our juicy steaks, boom. And then it's cleared the water, and you can see that the water is clear above them. And the water flows down the backside. And what we have left is a lot less algae in the surface. So the water is a lot clearer. And only little tiny algae because the, as the mussels like to eat the juicy steaks. And so it leaves us with only the sunflower seeds in the shell to grow after they have done it. And so I that's our model. And look at how clear these water becomes here because they're clearing that whole area. And so this, uh, this area here tends to be very low nutrient and very uh, low in uh, uh, particles as well. And so what Russell was saying, so when the circulation comes here, like remember that I was telling you, if there was nothing here, then it, everything just gets wiped out and then goes back, back here. But now we have these muscles slowing things down, and then a lot of the material that they are filtering from the, the top just stays around there. So that's another huge component of this model. So now this will be a really a lot of fun, and so you get to calculate some of the things and that we have been showing you to see how that has had a big impact in fisheries. Right. In our, in our closing activity, we are going to use what we have learned to calculate something about how big of an impact were the quagga mussels. How important is their changing of the ecosystem? Let's look at what we might have lost by shunting all that productivity to the bottom. Let's ask, how many walleyes would there have been if it wasn't for quagga mussels. So there's a walleye. That's a nice 18-inch walleye that weighs about a kilogram, 2.2 pounds. We know from studying walleyes by catching them and drying them out and grinding them up that the dry weight of a walleye is related to its length in a predictable manner. And that a 500 millimeter has about 315 grams of dry weight, and that dry weight is, is about 50% carbon. We measure it, and then um, we have 154 grams. Okay, so here we have uh, the quagga mussels on one of the Mid Lake reefs, and we have a size distribution that shows little ones and big ones, and there's about 8,500 per square meter. Here's another station on Sheboygan Reef. 
And this has a similar size frequency distribution, but there's about 35,000 per square meter. So the, the concentrations range hugely. We're going to take those ones and we're going to measure the length and we're going to measure the dry weight and look at what we get. We get a curved relationship, which looks like a power function. And in fact, when we fit this curve, we find that the dry weight is related to the length to the cubic. What does that mean? Cubic is volume. So the weight of the animal is proportioned to the volume of the animal. That's not a big surprise. And here is a really excellent example of that. We can transform that into a log-log plot, which linearizes this and allows us to easily predict the weight of an animal based on its length. And there you see 2.95. It's a cubic relationship. So we measure some of these animals, and then we use our dry weight to length. Here's the length, log of the length, and the log of the dry weight. And we find that, again, it's cubic, and we have a relationship. Then we take the tissue, and we grind it up, and we put it in a machine that tells us how much carbon and nitrogen. And we find that no matter how big they are or where they lived, that they always had 49% carbon and 10% nitrogen in them. So now we can add up. Here's a size frequency distribution from uh, the Northeast Reef. There's 13,000 per square meter. We know this relationship because we measured it, that the dry weight is related to the length. We can calculate the dry weight in the Ponar grab. We can calculate the dry weight per square meter. We know that the carbon is about 50% because we measured it. And so one square meter has 17.8 grams of carbon in quagga mussels. There were 150 grams of carbon in a walleye. So it would take about eight and a half square meters to make a walleye. Boy, what that's is a lot, Russell. It's a lot, but there's a lot of square meters. Let's look at how many square meters there are. Lake Michigan is 58,000 square kilometers. Well, kilometer is 1,000 meters, so 1,000 times 1,000 is a million square meters per square kilometer. That gives us 58 billion square meters which we can divide by about 10 square meters per walleye. And what's that? It's over 5 billion walleyes that instead are some yakko mussel laying on the bottom. It's yeah, not exact. They're not good to eat. They're not. We had them for the signing of the Great Lakes Compact, and the governor move wouldn't move eat them. On. Yeah. So, so this is our picture. This is the final analysis of the per square meter. Um, when we looked at the areas where there were no quagga mussels like it was before, there were amphipods and other animals that weighed in at about three, three grams per square meter of dry weight. The quagga mussels, the two examples we showed, ranged between 50 and a couple of hundred grams per square meter. So obviously, the weight of biomass has moved from being in the water column to being down at the bottom. And we call that ventification. So alien invasion stopped at sea is what Jason was trying to get across, but not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, we had 11 seconds left. Ah. <laughs> That's good. Any questions? I hope. I think they're working with it. I see some questions in the question and answer. Hi, yeah, sorry. I had some technical problems, so <laughs> I had to figure out was I had to figure out what was wrong on my end, but I can read the questions to you now. It looks like there's at least a few. Oh good. See, you can hear me all right, right? Yes. Okay. Um Let's see, the first question is, 
Are there any known negative consequences to other species resulting from the chemical control of sea lamprey larvae? Well, that's a good one. I think not. Mm -hmm. That one was tested quite a bit before it was implemented. They used uh, two different lamprey sites. Um, they went for one that was more targeted. And they do that um, in the rivers uh, where they actually uh, spawn. And they haven't had any uh, effects on the benthos there. So I think they're pretty safe. And up to now, they still continue to apply the lamprey side because they're still around. OK, um, we have a question asking about yellow perch. So yellow perch population was dropping prior to the zebra mussel establishment in Lake Michigan, according to your graph. What was causing that decline? Let's get that picture up Wait, there. Was it before? Wait, the walleye came. Oh, here. Yeah, there I got it. Is. Okay, what we're looking at here is not how many perch are in Lake Michigan, but how successful each year class is. So if you look at the catch per unit effort, then we're looking at the birth year. Birth year. So an animal that was born in 1990 is actually a large mature fish in 1993 or 1994 because the graph on the on the x-axis is birth year. So in reality, what happened was there was good recruitment, reasonably good recruitment throughout the 80s. And then in 1990 or so was the first year that hardly any of them made it to the adult stage. And the zebra mussels came in in 1988 or 89. The thing about the zebra mussels was that they colonized the reefs and the areas that the perch like to spawn. Perch swim all over Lake Michigan, but they spawn in the shallow waters right in the coastal zone. And that's where the zebra mussels really established and they changed the habitat to make it unsatisfactory for perch spawning. So when the perch spawn, they have um, a ribbon of eggs. And so if you can imagine uh, the rocks that are completely covered by the zebra mussels, they would cut up the eggs and such. The other important thing is that they were increasing the clarity of the water. So the perch didn't want to spawn there. So they started spawning uh, deeper and deeper. And that also uh, was part of the whole equation, as well as that um, a lot of the people were uh, actually getting the bigger fish out of the lake, and a lot of those are females. Yes, the, the little baby perch, when they're in the yolk sac stage, between the yolk sac and the juvenile stage, they swim up to the surface, and then they swim offshore to feed in the, the formerly plankton-rich offshore waters. But when they're spawned very deep, it's hard for them to swim up to the surface and offshore before they run out of energy, and then they're eaten by other fish. OK, we have another question asking, why are nano and picoplankton spared from being consumed by quagga mussels? Are they buoyant enough to remain above the mussels, or are the mussels unable to remove them from the water? Well, that's a really, a really good question, and it's partially both. Uh, where is my mouse? Where's my column? So, oh, wait. So, when, um, so if you, if we look at that, and we look at the uh, model that we were showing, where the vortex is coming uh, down into the mussels, that's when they are going to be able to. Uh, consume those picoplankton. But if they are not, um, you know, if you see here, you can see ones that are ones, twos, threes. Um, only when they are more aggregates of them, they would uh, eat them. But uh, other than that, they just go through and they don't eat, they don't get to be eaten by the mussels. And that's one of the, one of the components that can be uh, increasing those numbers because they don't get consumed as much. 
the muscles yeah. filter the water with something resembling a sieve. And the sieve yeah. has a size. What? Yeah. The sieve, ha sieve has a pore size that's three or four microns. And so anything that's smaller than that can zoom through. And anything that's bigger than that, they eat. So part of it is that a lot of the tiny picoplankton actually just are not retained by the feeding mechanism of the mussels. And they're, like you were saying, they're buoyant, so they wouldn't be reached by them except when uh, the lake gets mixed and everything is available. Do the Taylor column spiral downward over the MLRC because they are moving colder water off the bottom that is more dense? That's a, that's a good question. And the physics of Taylor columns have been mostly worked out in marine systems. If you look at the Great Meteor Seamount, for example, you'll find that there's been a quite a bit of work uh, looking at how the physics of the columns work. One thing that I didn't mention, because you only have so much time, is that the dotted white line represents the alkaline, or the area where the water and the cold water are mainly separated. And you see that in our diagram, most of the current action is actually happening underneath the thermocline, where all the water is cold. And that's also true in the ocean. You can't actually see the effect from the surface. You have to, in the stratified period, you have to look down into the water to see this activity going on. So I think that the density of the water has less to do with it than the Coriolis force of the water disconnecting from the bottom of the lake. Okay. It seems like nutrients aren't limiting in the surface waters based on the data you showed. Has anyone considered somehow seeding diatoms into the lake surface to try and compensate for losses to quagga mussels? Oh, do you want to do that one, well, Carmen? Do that. Seed. But you know, um, they're saying that there's no nutrients in the surface. So well, we're... that. Yeah. Let's talk about they don't know what no is. Okay, yeah. um, Lake Michigan is a, not unique, but is unusual in its behavior with respect to phosphorus. Phosphorus is a limiting nutrient for many lakes in North America and actually worldwide. Not all by any means, but in many. And in the picture that we show in the lower right-hand corner is surface phosphate, where on this scale, 0.05 is the smallest value that we can actually really effectively see. We can measure smaller values, but 0.05 is extremely small. So phosphate is very strongly limiting the yield of phytoplankton in Lake Michigan. So it is true that there is a serious nutrient limitation in the surface water. But the second part of your question, Carmen has a great answer for. It. Oh, seeding the, the diatoms. Seeding the diatoms. <laughs> well, you know, that's a, that's a really, uh, a really good question. And that's one that we uh, were discussing with our class last fall. And um, what happens if you add not only just the uh, diatoms, but you need to add other nutrients. So for example, you would need to, if you add a bunch of diatoms into the surface waters, they would just last very little. As we observed, um, when was that big flood? 2008. In 2008, so where we saw, and uh, we cannot, you know, we didn't show it right now, but where, where we observed is that the rivers were really flooded and a lot of the diatoms that came with went along across the lake and so the only thing is that they had their own nutrient with them but if you just seed them and do nothing else they would not survive 
Now, the other thing that you would have to add along with the, um, with the phosphorus is like iron, like in some of the ocean um, discussions that have been uh, around. So it's not so simple as to add that, but we could just um, add some nutrients into the middle of the lake, like phosphorus. Okay. Yeah, we have um, a few more minutes, so if anyone else has a question, we have a comment from someone saying that they enjoyed your presentation, but if anyone else has some more questions, um, we've got about, you know, 10 or 12 minutes. Okay. Um, certainly make use of having the speakers available to answer your questions, so go ahead and enter any that you might have. Inside. No, no, no. So... So when the muscles are going like this, and then they break that... Oh, the Ekman boundary the Ekman layer. Ekman boundary layer. So right. talk about that. Right, because one of the things that's important is that you might be thinking, how can they feed so Okay. Yeah, two more questions came in. Yep, she's asking, do mussels filter out the spawn of the perch because they're at the perch's breeding ground? Are quagga mussels found in any of the other Great Lakes?
Okay. If anyone else has um, another question, like I said, we've got a few more minutes. Um, okay, well, one came in. Um, does the softer water of Lake Superior of lower calcium carbonate concentration make fewer quaggas in the, in the lake? Okay, well it looks like that was the last question for the evening. So with that, I'd really like to thank both Russell and Carmen for presenting not just one, but two webinars um, for our webinar series this year. I think um, it was really interesting to get a introduction slash background on the food webs in Lake Michigan and then having you present your paper this evening and giving the, the educators who are participating tonight something that um, they will be able to use potentially in their classroom. So one, one reminder is that you know, we will be posting the recording of this webinar on our website tomorrow. But the website also has the link to the paper that the presenters have been discussing tonight. And we will also get, um, though it will be, a, I think you said, a PowerPoint presentation of the food webs where you can use them in your classroom. So all that information will be up on our website um, as early as possible tomorrow morning. And we hope that you will go to the website, download them and utilize them in your classroom and share them with other educators. Um, I Perfect. Um, I know I noticed a few of the participants have participated in all four of our webinars, so I particularly thank you for sticking with us for four evenings. Um, but we would like to thank everyone who participated tonight. And again, you know, if you ever have any suggestions for topics that you're interested in, or you need extra information on maybe what our presenters spoke about, um, the professional development webinar series also has a comment box at the bottom of the web page. So please feel free to leave questions or comments for our presenters in there and we will try to get answers or responses to you if needed. So again, I'd like to thank everyone and I hope you have a good evening and definitely make use of the recordings on our website. Thank you everyone.